This is Coding Math, Episode 7, Vectors, Part 2. Now, in Episode 6, Vectors, Part 1, I went over the basics of what vectors are, what they're used for, how they're represented, and some of the operations you can use on them. Now we can get down to writing some vector code. Now, just a quick disclaimer here. As we get into a bit more complex code, you're going to see things that, from a JavaScript best practices viewpoint, may not be ideal. I'll try to call out these sins as I commit them, but the goal here is to clearly demonstrate vector math, not write perfect JavaScript. By all means, use all the usual best practices if and when you finally implement this code in production. Okay, now in most languages, you can probably dig up a 2D or even a 3D vector library. These are particularly elegant in languages that allow you to create or override operators. For example, you can override the plus operator, and then if you have vectors v1 and v2, you can add them together. as simply as saying v3 equals v1 plus v2. But in languages that don't allow this, JavaScript for example, you have to provide methods like add and do something like v3 equals v1 dot add v2. So it's not quite as elegant, but it works. Now I'm sure you can find a 2D vector library in JavaScript, but let's try to create one from scratch, if only because it's a great exercise in understanding how to code vectors. Now there are a few ways to make reusable objects in JavaScript. The traditional way has been the pseudo class setup, where you create a constructor function, like function foo, and then you add methods to its prototype, so you say foo prototype do something equals function. And then you can create an instance of foo with the new operator. So you say my foo equals new foo. Now this gives you something that looks a bit like a class, but once you start using it, it doesn't really function too much like a traditional class. So until JavaScript has a much better class construct, I avoid this method. Then there are also JavaScript modules, which are very nice, but currently you'd need to use and understand another library such as require.js. This is a great setup, but it would take an entire video by itself and would have nothing to do with vectors. So in the interest of keeping things as simple as possible, with no other dependencies, I prefer the object create strategy. Here you create an object with properties and methods like so. Say var foo equals, and then you create a object literal, Give it a function like do something. We define that as a function and we flush that out. And this serves as a template that you can then create an instance of by passing it to object create. So you say my foo equals object create foo. The my foo object will now inherit the properties and methods of foo via prototypical inheritance, something I advise you to learn more about if you're doing any serious coding in JavaScript. Now, as we start creating the vector object, the question is how do we want to internally store the vector data? As you saw in the previous video, a vector can be represented by angle and length, or it can be represented by an x and y value. Either way you store it, you can calculate the other values pretty easily. I think I'll go with storing it as x and y values, but we'll provide set and get accessor methods for both representations. The set and get x and y methods will directly access the internal properties, but set and get angle and length will need to do some calculations. So we'll create a new file called vector.js, and we'll make sure we include this in our HTML file. Now in vector.js, we can start creating the vector object. So here's the first thing. I'm going to create this vector variable in the global namespace. Feel free to do better namespace management if this really bothers you. Then we'll create underscore x and underscore y values. These will be the internal values that everything else is based on. We'll default x to 1 and y to 0. This creates what we call a unit vector at angle 0. And a unit vector is simply a vector with a length of 1. Now as I just said, the set and get x and y functions will simply set and get the underscore x and underscore y properties directly. And of course there are ways in JavaScript to simulate private variables, but once again for the sake of simplicity, we'll just use underscores to indicate that these are supposed to be private. Next is the set angle function. First we'll call get length and save that to a local variable. Then we use the sine and cosine of the specified angle multiplied by this length to set x and y to new values. This is exactly what we covered in video 6. Then get angle uses math a102 to find the angle of the vector based on the current x and y values. 
This is a great demonstration of what was covered in video 5 on ArchTangent. Set length does almost exactly the same thing as set angle. It gets the current value for angle first, and then sets the x and y with the same formulas that set angle does. Finally, get length uses the Pythagorean theorem to get the length of the vector based on the length of x and y. Now, I haven't covered the Pythagorean theorem in any videos yet, but I probably will. Hopefully, it's somewhat familiar to you anyway. But in short, the Pythagorean theorem says that the square of the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. You'll usually hear this summarized as a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a and b are the legs and c is the hypotenuse of the right triangle. Now we can jump over to our main JS file and create a vector by saying v1 equals object create vector. And then we can set the x and y with v1 set x and v1 set y. Now that's a little bit wordy. So what I like to do is to provide a create method that acts as a kind of a constructor. So we jump back over to vector.js. We can add this create function that looks like this. It takes x and y arguments. Then it calls object create passing in this. Here, this will refer to the vector object itself. So it's really the same as saying object create vector. It then calls set x and set y in this new object, passing in the values it just got. And finally, it returns that object. Now we can jump back to the main.js file and create a new vector much more simply by just saying v1 equals vector create 10 comma 5. Now we can check the values of this vector by logging them. We can log get x, get y, get angle, and get length. Then we can switch over to Chrome and check the console. So get x and y return the values we just set, 10 and 5, so that's correct. Get angle and get length return values which aren't quite as obvious, but I've checked them and they are correct. Finally, we can set angle and length and see what that does. Say v1 set angle, math pi divided by 6, which is equivalent to 30 degrees. And v1 set length, 100. Now if you recall from the Q&A number one video, we know that in a 30, 60, 90 triangle, the side opposite the 30 degree angle will be half the hypotenuse, and the adjacent side should be about 0.866 times the hypotenuse. Let's check by logging those two values. So we log get x and get y. Then we switch over to Chrome and see what we have. 50 is half of 100, and 86.6 something is right on. So we're doing well so far. Now let's create an add method and get that working. Switch back over to our vector.js. And the add function will take v2, which is another vector. And this is going to return a new vector, which is the sum of this vector and the other vector passed in. In video number six, you learn that this is as simple as adding the x's and y's. Now we can just as easily create a subtract function by subtracting the x and y of the second vector from the first. Multiply is a bit different. Remember, this takes a scalar, not a vector, and multiplies the magnitude or length of the vector by that scalar. In this code, that's as simple as multiplying both the x and y values. So we get a value in, and we create a new vector that is equal to the x and y time that value passed in. And while we're here, we might as well just throw in a divide method. Now let's test some of these new ones. We'll create vectors v1 and v2 and add them together, storing the result in v3. Vector 1 is 10, 5. Vector 2 will be 3, 4. And vector 3 is v1, add v2. Then we can check the x and y of v3, which should be 13 and 9. So we log that. We check Chrome, and all is good. Now we can test multiplication by making a vector and checking its length. v1 will be a new vector of 10, 5, and we log that. Then we can multiply it by 2, storing the result in v2 and checking v2's length. So we say v1 multiply 2, and we log v2's length, and we check it in the console, and sure enough, v2 is twice as long as v1.
Now you might ask why all these methods return new vectors instead of just altering the existing vector. Well, remember I said that in some languages you can override operators. This would allow you to write things like v3 equals v1 plus v2, or vb equals va times 2. In these cases, you wouldn't expect v1, v2, or va to be altered. The methods we created here are analogous to these operators, so we won't alter the originals either. In the case that you want to do something like add an assign, v1 plus equals v2, you can just say v1 equals v1 add v2, which will override the vector in the v1 variable with the new vector created by the add method. Of course, you can also create additional methods that alter the vector in place, like add2, for example. Here we are actually altering the internal x and y values and not returning anything. In the same way, we can make a subtract from function in a multiply by, and just for completeness, a divide by. We'll do a quick test of at least one of these. And going back to the addition code we had earlier, we'll get rid of the v3 and instead use add2 with v1. So we say v1 add2 v2. And we change the log statement to trace out v1's values. And there you go, that works as well. So, we have a minimal 2D vector library. We'll use this in several of the upcoming videos on physics, and in future videos we'll add to this with more advanced methods, such as normalize, dot product, and cross product. So, see you next week where we'll dive into velocity using vectors.